All right, so I know that you're very excited to learn more about the chromatography column. I mean, who isn't, right? So I know that that's why you've came back to watch this video, and I'm going to try my best to basically describe a little bit more about the column and what goes on the inside. All right, so in the previous video, we talked about this concept of silica or alumina used in the column. All right, now when I hand make a column, and when we go through our very first lab, and when Michael Tisfit basically did his lab long, long, long ago, uh, polar stationary phases were very common. And I'm going to quickly change that narrative on you uh, a little bit later when we get into the actual equipment pieces. But for now, we're looking at polar stationary phases. So silica and alumina are very, very common, all right? Whenever I pack a handmade column and whenever I look for stationary phases that are polar, silica and alumina are one of the first two go-to stationary phases that are out there. Uh, not necessarily because they're cheap. Uh, silica and alumina, especially alumina itself, uh, one gram can cost $1. So a typical 500 gram bottle, that's not a lot when you think about it, could be $500 or more on a bad day uh, when we decide to order for replacement. So this stuff can get quite expensive. Uh, and especially if you think about some of those older columns in the previous video where these columns are as large as people. Imagine how many grams it would take to fill a column like that. You're looking at tens of thousands of dollars invested in stationary phase just to separate two components. So very often it doesn't make sense. And that's one of the reasons that we use a very narrow piece of glass for our column, such as a pipetter. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of material to pack that column, and it still does a perfectly good job for us uh, that we need it to do. So we save a little bit of money, we choose smaller columns, less amount of material, less amount of money to operate it. Now, silica and alumina um, are both polar, and they're very similar in structure, and they do very similar things. So as far as silica or alumina, which is better, uh, I'm basically going to say there is no major difference between the two. Uh, alumina, there's more things that we can do with it. Silica is more just kind of the basic foundation level. And if you want some of the variants or you want some choices that can happen, then alumina might be the best way to go. But as far as the separation is concerned, silica and alumina are very similar to each other. The silica is SiO2, and the alumina is Al2O3. Uh, the silica, SiO2, that's also the structure for sand, and that's also the structure for glass. So if you're crafty, you would have picked up on that. The difference is how they are ordered in a three-dimensional fashion. So the silica, the sand, the glass, they're all similar structures. However, the way that you order them up in a 3D environment can change the structure uh, and the functionality of these molecules. The Al203, that is aluminum, and you can kind of see aluminum into the name. Alum is how it starts off, right? So that's in, in regard to the Al that's present. But I said that both of these are polar, and you should pick up that these oxygens that are inside of this compound have the free pairs of electrons. And that's where the polarity is going to come into play. So that's the reason that they work. It's due to the oxygens that are present. Uh, and those oxygens are going to provide us some free pairs of electrons that's going to be the fingers that hold our compounds back. All right, so you're probably familiar with silica. You would know this as silica gel, uh, and these are what we would call the silica gel packets that you might see in a purse or you might see in something that you've ordered from the mail, uh, and these are desiccant packets. So the purpose of these is to absorb water. It's a desiccant, and that's the definition of a desiccant, right? So I probably don't want to be putting water inside of this column. Right? That would kind of make sense. If silica gel is used as a desiccant and it absorbs water, then I probably don't want to put water in the column and allow the separation to happen. So that's why it's very important sometimes in the procedure 
to go in and remove all of the water from the sample because I don't want it messing up the stationary phase if I'm using silica or alumina. Right Now, later on, that narrative, again, is going to change, but we're talking about the very basic column chromatography setup here. Here's the structure of silica. It's SiO2, uh, and this is going to be the outside layer. So that's why these are OHs here. All right. So these OH groups, you would know those as alcohol groups, and these have free pairs of electrons on the oxygens. They're not drawn, but they're understood to be there. And this is going to give me some polarity on the outside layer of the silica gel itself. Uh, the oxygens, notice this change, SiO, SiO, SiO. Uh, these oxygens also have free pairs of electrons on them. So there's uh, going to be two pairs of electrons on those, uh, just like there's two pairs of electrons on these. So that gives me more polarity on these oxygens in the center. And then the reason that these oxygens are drawn down below is because that pattern will repeat. So we would have a silica here, and then an oxygen, then a silica, then an oxygen, then a silica, then an oxygen, and so on. So this is going to be a caged network that's very similar from front to back, left to right. And that's the main body of what we would call the silica compound. So SiO2, you've seen it before. Imagine taking these little silica beads and imagine crushing them into a fine powder. And that's kind of the powder that gets used in the actual column itself. All right. Now, alumina doesn't look any different. Uh, if you take a look at alumina, the Al2O3, 203 it's going to be a white, very fine powder as well. Sometimes the alumina is a little bit finely textured. Uh, so this is a little bit fluffier. It's a little bit more lightweight. It's a little bit more airborne. Uh, and you don't want to be breathing this stuff in, right, if you're using it every day. But alumina and silica look very, very similar in a lab environment. And actually, here's a picture that compares the two. So over here to the left is silica. Over here to the right is alumina. And if you just look at the, uh, the watch glasses, you're going to see they look almost identical to each other. There's not really a big difference between the two. One is silica-based, the other one is alumina-based. Uh, the thing with alumina is that I told you it had more variations and more choices, right? So with the alumina, uh, it can come in what we call different forms. So one of those forms that are very common is what we call the mesh range. Uh, the mesh range is basically how large of a particle do you need. So if they were going to crush this up for you, do they crush it up just a little bit and make it rocky? Or do they crush it up a lot and make it a really, really fine powder? That is what the mesh grade is going to be concerning, okay? The size of the actual chunk itself. And we can also order it what we call activated or deactivated. And those two variations are basically its stickiness. How do molecules stick to the alumina? Uh, in what order do they stick there? How long do they stick there? Uh, how much force do we have to uh, put into the column to get it removed and out of um, the column and into the container? So activated and deactivated alumina is also a choice. And if you take a look at the back of your textbook in the red hardback lab manual uh, from Lemon, uh, you will actually see um, them do a discussion on alumina and talk about the different variants that are present. So that might be a very good re resource for you to go to to kind of brush up on the alumina choices that you might see in a uh, working laboratory environment. Okay, so um, as far as the uh, lab book is concerned, since I've mentioned it, uh, that is an Operation 21. So if you go to Operation 21 in the back of the hardback, uh, you're going to see a huge section that talks about stationary phases and column chromatography. Uh, and they talk about the alumina grades. Um, the most active is going to be with the water removed, grade 1. Uh, it might not be the best for us, depending on what we're analyzing. It also talks about alumina and silica gel, but it also talks about other forms of stationary phase that you might want to choose as well and why you would choose those. Uh, the 
eluents that are typically used with these, um, how you separate inside of the column, what are some of the good techniques to use and to maybe go by, and directions on how to pack a column. So it's going to refer to you to Operation 21 when we do our Lacapine uh, column chromatography experiment. And if you want to take the time and read that, it might do you very well, especially when the test rolls around, so you know what to expect and you know what to study for. So it'll walk you through all of the steps needed, not only for the lab, but some background information as well that's pretty important. Okay, so that's the story with alumina, and that's the story with silica. Those are the two main, um, what I would call, stationary phases in a column. Uh, notice that these are polar again, uh, and you always want to pair it up with the opposite. So my mobile phase in this case would be something that would be organic, something that would be non-polar in nature, preferably. So my mobile phase and my stationary phase have to be opposites in order for this thing to work most of the time. So if my stationary phase is polar, my mobile phase has to be a non-polar compound. If my stationary phase is non-polar, then my mobile phase would have to be a polar compound. So opposites attract and opposites work in the world of chromatography. Okay, so that probably means I don't want to be choosing water. I don't want to be choosing alcohol. I don't want to be choosing any type of maybe uh, small ester, uh, something that has some polarity associated with it as my mobile phase. Uh, when I'm working with silica or alumina. I really want it to be more organic, more nonpolar in nature for this thing to work. Okay. Finally, the very last thing that I want to talk about before we turn to the world of um, equations in chromatography is this thing called flash chromatography. All right. So what's flash chromatography? Well, what you're going to find out is that when you do this lab experiment, uh, column chromatography can take very long, okay? And when I say long, it could be 10 minutes, which is doable, and I could be patient and wait for that, but it can also be hours. And maybe I don't want to wait hours for my thing to separate off. Now, your lycopene lab won't take hours for it to separate, but there are some methods out there that I can use to my advantage to increase the speed at which this whole thing happens. I need to push the speed up in order for my mobile phase to go through the column and to pull components through the column. Uh, and the way that I do that is very simple. Uh, if I take a column, right, and this column has a stopcock and it kind of tapers off here at the bottom like a burette does, uh, but if I put an attachment down here on the bottom, and if this attachment can go to some kind of vacuum, then what I can do is pull my sample through quicker because the vacuum is pulling it through for me. Think of the aspirators that we have in the laboratory, right? It's same kind of concept. Now, this vacuum could be a $1,000 vacuum pump, right, if I needed it. But the vacuum could also just be some type of simple plunger or some type of simple syringe that I might use in the lab as well. And that's all that you really need. So some kind of sucking device that I can basically put onto the end of a column and I pull the sucking device and this allows my mobile phase to be sucked through the column and not just let gravity do the work for me. Uh, this is possible. It can be used. We don't need it for what we decide to do in our lab, uh, but you might see this out there. And if they talk about flash chromatography, you now know what they're discussing, right? So here's this glass pipette that you might make for your lycopene. You don't need the flash part of the chromatography here because that's going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, but here you see the syringe, and the syringe is connected to a T-joint, right? So you're just basically pulling the syringe backward. It's creating some suction flow, and this is pulling your mobile phase and your sample through the column even quicker than what it was going through already. 
So that's the definition of flash chromatography, a technique that speeds up the normal chromatography process. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop this video. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some background information about the column and about the stationary phases and how the mobile phases work, the structures of the stationary phases, why things separate the way that they do. And now we're going to kind of turn our attention to some of the common calculations and equations and definitions that we would see coming from an instrument or in the chromatography field itself. So get your calculators ready because you might need them in the next video.